Welcome to the High Rise Podcast, presented by Headset, the leading data and analytics company for the cannabis industry. Welcome back to the High Rise, a laid back data back conversation where we talk all things cannabis from US MSOs to Canadian LPs, product and market analysis through the lens of data. My name is Cy Scott with Headset, and I'm joined as always by Emily Paxia of Poseidon. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the High Rise. And today we've got a very special episode with a very uh, special set of guests. Uh, please welcome Brian Vicente, partner at Vicente Cedarberg, and Mason Tivert, partner at VS Strategies, a consulting affiliate of Vicente Cedarberg. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Thanks so much. So why don't we start with a little bit about your your background? I know you guys have obviously been in the space a long, long time. So why don't you uh, enlighten our listeners, like how you got started, where you're coming from, and all the experience in the industry so far. Sure. This is Brian. I can jump in a little bit here. And um, it's worth noting, you know, we're, we're celebrating the 10-year anniversary of the Colorado legalization vote, um, which Mason and I both played a, a giant role in. And we just did a, a big event at the Colorado History Museum with the, with the governor, with the U.S. Senator John Higginlooper, Denver mayor, all these luminaries. So we're, you know, we're just kind of riding high off that. But um, uh, I began doing this work in really 2004, full-time, working on cannabis reform. And a lot of that was you know, based in Colorado, uh, representing medical marijuana patients, folks that were you know, dying of AIDS or cancer, and wanted to use cannabis and were upset they were being arrested for it. And um, you know, Mason will speak about his experience, but we essentially ran campaigns in the state uh, somewhat relentlessly for eight years straight, whether those were you know, kind of impact lawsuits or ballot initiatives or media stunts uh, in order to, to really kind of educate the voters of this state on the fact that, you know, there's a better path for cannabis than prohibition. And uh, you know, that built up into the 2012 legalization vote, which made Colorado the first place in history to, to legalize cannabis. And, and here we are today. It's incredible. 10 years. It's, it's so insane to think about, you know, how, how far we've come and how, how far we have to go. So in 2012, with the legalization, can you um, articulate a little bit about your involvement? I know Vicente Cedarberg was, was pretty heavily invested at the time and continues to be invested, but what did, what did that look like back then? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was a full-time job, that's for sure. Mason and I were the co-chairs of the campaign, uh, and I led up a lot of the drafting, just being a, an attorney by trade, which was a pretty big tent process. We really wanted to get feedback from all ends of the spectrum, whether that's medical marijuana growers or you know, prior law enforcement or regulators, you know, et cetera. It was an ambitious campaign and that no state had, had ever legalized cannabis before. But uh, you know, there's a lot of ups and downs, but we were ultimately successful. Yeah, it's crazy to think. I'm here in Seattle, Washington, and um, you know, Washington was also 2012, although um, Colorado beat Washington by opening January 1st, I believe, in 2014, taking kind of the the medical structure, the dispensary structure, and then I think it was like adding another door. Is that is that right? For adult use, same facilities often, same dispensaries, but they had like an adult use section and a medical section. Was that kind of how the, the initial rollout looked like? Essentially, yes. I mean, we had had a pretty robust medical marijuana you know, infrastructure for years and it had been working regulated appropriately. And so we, we kind of said, all right, let's, let's, uh, you know, mimic that process, allow these uh, medical stores to opt in to sell dual use if they so, if they so choose, but certainly have some, you know, some separation. So there, there's not confusion about the products or the tax structure, but yes, you know, we were the same night as Washington. We, we did, we beat you guys by a time zone, but what, one thing that we did when we wrote the law was we want, we, we wrote some specific dates, you know, this, we forced the state to, to allow uh, businesses to open by, by certain dates and time. And that's actually in our state constitution. And so that, that really kind of lit a fire in the state and allowed us to, to move forward you know, relatively quickly with the process. Yeah. And I'm, I was relatively new to Washington in 2014. I'm, I'm from California, but moved up here really to see the adult use market open up and be here kind of day one in, in Washington, uh, post, post legalization. And the thing that was so different about Washington versus Colorado is Washington was, I, I would say, poorly regulated medical, you know, much like, like California, it was, it was really loose at the time. And so what they had to do as, as you know, you, you're well aware is that they shuttered all the dispensaries and switched everyone over to adult use uh, or, you know, licensing new licenses, adult use licenses. 
you know, to the detriment, I'm sure of, of medical patients at the time, I know, you know, a lot of the products and regulations, it was pretty tight for adult use, pretty limited for adult use. And I think since then, medical really hasn't, hasn't stood back up effectively, you know, in the state of Washington, but it was really kind of cool to see like two different approaches. And since then, I mean, there, you know, however many states medical and adult use, there's like however many approaches, I feel like everybody's doing it differently since you guys were so involved in, in Colorado at the time and, and others, you know, since then, is there a model that you guys like? Is there something that you think is the, the best for states going forward? Or is it really just kind of state to state? Ultimately, it's going to be state to state, just as it is with alcohol. You know, so many factors are involved here uh, involving, you know, things like the existing government structures. I mean, Washington had uh, alcohol is controlled by a, a liquor control board. Colorado doesn't have a liquor control board. We have a Department of Revenue with a liquor enforcement division. By definition, they couldn't be done the same way. And, you know, there's just constantly going to be different examples of that. States that are home rule states like Colorado and Washington, where, where local governments have a lot of power compared to out east, uh, what are known as Dillon rule states, where uh, it's really things are, are controlled by the state and localities don't have a lot of power. So there's just going to be so many areas in which they differ. And it really is going to come down to how each state decides to do it. And of course, they'll learn from each other and they will borrow uh, ideas that may work, but they are going to have their own experiences with this and it'll be driven by what the public wants. And, and we continue to see that playing out with alcohol. You know, Colorado, we, we got three initiatives on the ballot this year around alcohol. You know, whether stores can own multiple liquor licenses, whether it can be delivered, uh, whether wine can be sold in grocery stores. I mean, these are questions that always come up around the country and uh, we're going to see the same thing with cannabis. Yeah. And it's interesting that you mentioned alcohol because I was curious. I know you were heading up the campaign to regulate marijuana like alcohol, and that was tied into the support of Amendment 64. So can you tell us a little bit about your background, Mesa, and how you got into this? And and then we'll talk a little bit more about the Sente Cedar Burr. Sure. Well, I, you know, I moved out to Colorado to uh, start an organization called SAFER, which stood for a Safer Alternative for Enjoyable Recreation. And, you know, the goal of the organization was to educate the public about the simple fact that cannabis is less harmful than alcohol. At that time, only about a third of the population understood that that fact. And so uh, fortunately now, uh, thanks to like the work that's been done, not just here in Colorado, but around the country and, you know, the discussion that's taking place, we now see about two thirds of the country recognizes that cannabis is safer than alcohol or more. And the, the whole idea was really um, among people who understand that fact, most of them think it should be legal. And among the people who don't understand that fact, most of them think it should be illegal. So the goal was let's increase the percentage of the public that knows marijuana is safe from alcohol. And the theory was that, that they'd be more likely to support legalization and that theory held up. So, you know, we ran initiatives, we did publicity stunts, all sorts of things to really just get that message out there over and over and over again uh, and, and kind of change the, the way that people are thinking about this, this product. What was one uh, publicity stunt that you that you ran? I'm just kind of curious. Oh, wow. There's so many. I, I, you know, since uh, we did just have a uh, uh, U.S. Senator John Hickenlooper, former governor of Colorado, former mayor of Denver, uh, came and spoke in favor of legalization at our 10th anniversary event recently. Let's focus on on some of those around him, which included uh, chasing him around the city with a person in a chicken suit and a sign that said, hey, Mayor <laughs> Chickenlooper, what's so scary about marijuana? Challenging him to a drug duel. Uh, he owned a brew pub and uh, we said, you know, you drink your beer and we'll smoke marijuana and we'll see who lasts longer. Just a whole, you know, we labeled him a drug dealer who sells a more dangerous drug than marijuana. You know, really whatever we could do to get people thinking about and talking about that message. Yeah. Yeah. And you were also involved in the marijuana policy project at the time. Is that right? Or is that came, came later? No, correct. So I, I was hired uh, by the Marijuana Policy Project right out of college to do some campaign work in 2004. And then the Marijuana Policy Project funded uh, SAFER and, and helped us get started and was really our largest funder for throughout the course of our work in Colorado leading up to Amendment 64. And then it was the largest backer of Amendment 64. And after that, I, I went on to become the, the director of communications for, for MPP. And so 
got a, a long and sordid history there. Yes, yes. Well, I want to come back to that because uh, your interview back in 2014 uh, with Nancy Grace is potentially one of my, still one of my favorite moments of media history of, of my time in this cannabis industry. And um, so one of the things I was curious, it's because during my, so I was on the board of Marijuana Policy Project. I've talked about that a bit on the pod. And I, I always really liked meeting the different folks who were involved in the organization because I had a specific reason I got into this space. There were several folks I knew, especially on the board, who were just opposed to the idea of the government having kind of an overreach on this issue. And again, kind of as it relates to not having an overreach on alcohol, although you make some good points that we still have a long way to go in terms of how alcohol is is regulated. And for both of you, was there anything that was planted before this or was it just that you felt that, you know, you, you thought this is an issue that needed to be changed? What were the impetus for you getting into the industry or into this aspect of it? Yeah, I could, I could speak a bit to that. I mean, I think, you know, some of it was just this intellectual dishonesty, right? You're looking at the government policies related to cannabis and how they didn't actually accomplish anything really, except spending a lot of money and ruining a lot of lives. But, you know, I, I was certainly, uh, you know, interested and moved by just the, uh, you know, the, the racist nature of cannabis prohibition and how that's continued to carry on. Where black and brown people arrested four times the rate of whites for using cannabis, but they, they don't use it higher rates. So just these continuing inequities and the idea that we could somehow, uh, you know, impact that the, our, our advocacy work was very, was certainly very compelling to me. For me, it was just more of a personal vendetta. Um, <laughs> you know, I enjoyed cannabis in college. I was uh, investigated and, and harassed by law enforcement. I was subpoenaed by a multi-jurisdictional grand jury and drug task force and basically just shaken down around my, my cannabis use. Unfortunately, um, that did not turn into any sort of serious consequences. They were just fishing for information, but it scared the hell out of me. And, you know, I was already interested in cannabis legalization just generally. I thought, you know, it was interesting. I probably knew more than the typical college student. But really after that personal experience, you know, uh, that really got me looking more deeply into it and, and, and learning a lot about many of the issues Brian just referenced, you know, around the history of cannabis prohibition and, and you know, the disproportionate impacts on, on certain communities. And really, it was just became a, an issue I was passionate about. And I was lucky enough to to be given the opportunity to, to work in it and make a living, which I will say did not initially start as much of a living, but <laughs> has managed to grow into one. Yeah, it's interesting. So my brother and I had started really watching what was going on in Colorado in 2020. 12 and because this is when you know we kind of came to consciousness around how we wanted to think about cannabis and your crew like the whole lot of you all and what is ultimately kind of the Vicente Saderberg universe really stood out as almost like you know quite famous to us as people who brought this change to light and then of course there's some folks like Betty Oldworth some other people we've worked with along the way so we wanted to understand, you know, on your 10-year anniversary, how did you decide to to get this together with Christian? You know, forming businesses together, you have to understand how people work and how you think. So can you tell us a little bit about how you built this together? Sure. Yeah. You know, it's it's interesting. I mean, there was a, a real grassroots side to this. I mean, Mason spoke about, you know, how we used to chase around the Senator Hickenlooper and others, and there are also protests and provocative billboards and just, you know, a lot of pretty aggressive tactics that we brought to the table. Throughout all this, you know, I was out there also, you know, speaking to groups of patients, speaking to groups of prospective business owners about their rights under the medical marijuana law, their the possibility that they could expand those rights under the adult use law and perhaps have a business around it. And as it became more and more real and these businesses started to, you know, actually need legal services, I had to, you know, fine tune my, my legal skills in that area. And that was part of why I connected with Christian Cederberg and the law firm is Vicente Cederberg, uh, who was, you know, just a, a tremendous business law lawyer who, um, you know, we started chatting about the opportunity here and we're able to, to come together and then really provide those, those important business services, which, which businesses in this space need. Right. And, and, you know, we've, we've then been able to, you know, I think, re, you know, retain some of our uh, activist cred. We stay involved in a lot of different campaigns and we're, we're helping to actually push to um, you know, decriminalize uh, you know, psychedelic mushrooms here in Colorado in two weeks that'll be voted on while also, you know, providing, you know, solid legal services. This is a legitimate industry. I mean, you, you know that as well as anyone, Emily, and, and these folks need 
good lawyers to help to help navigate the, the business struggles and the regulatory structures. And it's constantly changing. So, um, you know, we kind of just filled that niche. Like I said, I got hired out of college and was, uh, you know, went and worked on some campaigns in Arizona where I'm from. And uh, that's where I met Brian in 2004. Brian was, uh, had just finished law school and was out there also doing some work for the Marijuana Policy Project. And we met. And then uh, when I moved to Colorado, uh, you know, a few months after that to, to start Safer, he was here doing Sensible Colorado and, and a lot of stuff around medical cannabis. And We've worked together, you know, ever since, you know, after the Amendment 64 passed, the Sente Cedarburg had been established and, and those guys really just took off with regards to, you know, opening offices in other states and, uh, of course, really working on Colorado and, and building out everything that was going on here while I decided to, to kind of focus my my attention on, on other states, but from more of a, a advocacy perspective and worked on the initiatives uh in you know maine and massachusetts and nevada alaska uh was at the marijuana policy project and various state legislative efforts you know that kind of continued for a while until i decided i was going to make the jump into the for-profit sector for the for the first time and i was very fortunate in that you know vicente cedarberg and the partners there along with steve fox uh, my mentor who had uh, helped found safer and really oversaw the amendment 64 effort uh, they had started VS strategies to to do you know public affairs and and policy work in the cannabis space and I was able to join that outfit and uh, you know since then we've really just been been working side by side on a lot of these things. And um, I had a question about the the 10th anniversary event. You, you guys have been talking about Hickenlooper a, a bit here, and uh, he was the governor at the time. And I remember that he wasn't particularly pro cannabis. But it looks like uh, he attended the the celebration, talked about his his change of mind. What does he talk about? Like, what really did it for him, or what was his concern in in the beginning? Like, why was he not a proponent for it? And then what brought him around? Um, well, you know, like a lot of public officials, he had concerns around public safety and and public health. I mean, you know, to be honest, I don't know how seriously concerned he was versus how politically concerned he was. I'm not sure. I can't really say, but you know. Cannabis had been legal, illegal for decades, you know, for older people, their whole lives for decades and decades, they've been hearing nothing but negative things about cannabis, about how dangerous it is, about how horrible it is, about how bad the people who use it or sell it are, you know, and that's hard to overcome for a lot of people, especially people who don't use cannabis that, you know, helps them develop more critical thinking skills. But, you know, that's, that's difficult for some people to overcome. And especially when you're in a, you know, as a public official who is not only, you know, in a political situation of, you know, not wanting to, to screw up, but also of course, you know, not wanting to do anything that could hurt public health and safety, they're extremely cautious. And so I think that, you know, that was his take was that, you know, he believed that it, it was just too unfamiliar territory and didn't know enough. And, you know, was worried that, that he, you know, he didn't want to be, at the helm if, if the ship went down, you know? And I think that what he realized after Amendment 64 passed and was implemented successfully is that the ship did not go down. The sky did not fall. You know, it actually worked out quite well. And, you know, we've seen a number of benefits ranging from, you know, the public health and safety benefits of regulation to the tax revenue. And, you know, to his credit, he acknowledged this and, you know, if it's obviously it's, it's always weird to buddy up with former opponents, but you know, that's what we wanted. We wanted the guy to change his mind and he did. So we can't really complain about that. And, and we were very honored to have him join us and, and to stand up and say that. Yeah. I think it's great. I think it's rare, you know, to see a politician uh, do that and, uh, and it changed their their position. So I, I think it's fantastic that uh, he's he's now you know more of an advocate than he was uh, previously. And also, you know, I want to ask you guys a bit about the federal side. I mean, there's some pretty big news, you know, a couple of weeks ago with Biden talking about cannabis for the first time, uh, you know, since his campaign uh, and changes he wants to make. And, and thinking about Hickenlooper now, you know, at the federal side as a senator, you know, I think coming in. As a senator, I think it's just another voice in the room that hopefully will help push this forward. What do you guys think about federal change? You know, certainly state by state is pushing us there. Do you think, uh, you know, we're going to see something pretty significant here in the in the 180 days of, of review that, that Biden put forth? I think, I mean, it's Biden's statement and actions on, on cannabis recently were, I mean, simply remarkable. I mean, it's the biggest move by an American president on cannabis since Jimmy Carter. So, and I, and I, you know, we're fairly active on the Hill and I, I think it's safe to say this is 
breathed a lot of you know life into cannabis reform. And I think a lot of Democrats are looking at themselves and saying, you know, wow, if the, the most important and fairly moderate Democrat in the, in the world is on board with this, maybe I can be a little more of a champion. And I think there's there's potential for 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 something something positive this year, whether that's safe banking or this climate act or you know, one of these sort of bills to take off, it seems likely. And I think playing into that is, you know, the fact that we probably will have five states vote to legalize here in just a matter of weeks. And then you have, you know, members of Congress, you know, of course, they won't be in Congress until 2023, but you have that sort of movement going on where you have folks coming from the, those regions, which are, I think, entirely Republican states, with the exception of Maryland, that will be voting on cannabis reform, coming to D.C. and, and you know, asking themselves, are they going to support the will of their voters? Are they going to vote to criminalize those individuals? What are they going to do? So I think there's a sea change going on. I feel, I feel pretty optimistic. Did you, did you see this coming? Or the timing of this? How did you feel about it when it when it came out a couple of Thursdays ago? Uh, it came out on my birthday, so I oh. think it was October sixth. It was a present for Biden. But um, you know, we were actually pretty involved in helping to to raise money and try to you know really. We did an event for Biden that was fairly elaborate with some members of the Grateful Dead, and really were hopeful that we would see some major movement on cannabis and we didn't see anything for years you know and so this came a little out of the blue honestly and and uh but i think it, it speaks to the fact that the polling on this has shifted and maybe he's you know, clearly he's a busy guy there's a lot of priorities but this just seems to me low-hanging fruit his way to kind of give back to the movement i guess and, and hopefully push us uh, further down the line yeah, I have to be honest, uh, you know, I was pretty enthusiastic upon the news and um, it, it helps to hear someone with your level of experience and the amount of time and effort you've put into this to also be feeling that way about it. So it's good to hear. I So to that extent, you, you know, you two have been focusing on this industry for now, you know, a long time, concerted effort with Vicente Cedarbergs for 10 years. What are some highlights or lowlights from this time and, and how, how have you felt about it? Have you seen things moving? And, and this can be state to state, not just at federal level, but have things moved faster or slower than you thought? I'm just curious to hear your perspective over these years. It's one of those things people used to ask, uh, you know, way back when they'd say, did you expect to be able to legalize cannabis in Colorado? Like, did it seem realistic? And, you know, I always felt like, you know, it, it just was so such a gradual and, and you know, steady incline, you know, like we just, uh, things just kept building and building and, and moving in the right direction and, and more and more progress that at the, you know, by the time Amendment 64 passed, it just didn't even seem that wild. Uh, it seemed somewhat expected. Um, and I think that that's kind of how I view things going with, with cannabis policy overall, uh, is that, you know, especially within the last decade, I mean, we've seen so much activity, so much development, so much progress uh, at the state level. While we haven't seen policy change uh, all that much at the federal level, we've seen some. I mean, I, you know, when Brian and I first started doing this, when I mentioned we were working on a campaign in 2004, we were working uh, on what was then known as the Hinchy Rohrbacher Amendment, uh, which is, you know, the, the rider, the appropriations rider that says the federal government can't spend money interfering in state medical marijuana laws. And it was losing. It was losing every year significantly. But, you know, that now has passed multiple times and with very strong support. Uh, we've also seen additional, you know, riders that have been passed. So there has been some change. And obviously there's far more members of Congress, far more people willing to sponsor legislation, you know, looking even beyond the states and, and our federal government, we've seen countries moving forward, Uruguay, Canada, Germany is now talking. So, you know, it's really moving pretty quickly. And while it's frustrating in the moment sometimes, especially around federal law, you know, this is, uh, moving pretty fast. And I think, you know, like when the Ken Burns documentary eventually comes out, I mean, you know, <laughs> we're, we're only on like episode two of like, you know, five, six hour episodes. Right. You know? Uh, so I think there's plenty more to be done, but um, it's, it's going quick. Yeah. I, I actually rewatched the Ken Burns prohibition documentary kind of regularly, <laughs> just to remind myself of the way these things work. But uh, it's an interesting rhyme to what we've been experiencing. You mentioned, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're pretty actively involved in the Hill and, and, and making change. I always, you know, wonder, you know, um, how, how can 
people get more involved, uh, you know, to, to help accelerate change, any recommendations on, on what just a, like an average person can do? You know, I, our campaign, right. If you look back at the last 15, 18 years, Mason and I've working on this, it's actually really been ground up. You know, like we've got active at the, at the local level, changing local laws in Denver or Breckenridge or wherever. And then, um, then did things at the state level and now legal in 19 states. And, and that is sort of creating pressure on Congress. Uh, so that's not to say people shouldn't just sort of, you know, jump all, jump the line and, and call their members of Congress. They, they should. But I think to the extent people get involved in sort of local efforts and state efforts, and there's really, I, I think, a, a thirst for input at these many states that are trying to figure out how to appropriately regulate cannabis. And, and one of the major changes we've seen in the last 10 years is there's a very robust discussion about social equity with cannabis licenses. And like Hispanics, I'm part of the National Hispanic Cannabis Council. And, you know, Hispanics are 20% of our population, but only 6% of marijuana business owners. Like that's pretty fucked up. If you think about the fact that marijuana became illegal to criminalize Mexican immigrants in our country. So it's like, how do we address these inequities? And, but fortunately we have state regulatory authorities and state meetings and local meetings that are uh, by regulators that are, are looking for input from, from various communities about how to appropriately uh, shape these laws. So I, I think there's, there's opportunity to kind of participate in that way or, yeah, certainly there, you know, if you're in any of the five states voting on legalization this November, uh, organizing around that, as I mentioned earlier, Colorado will be voting to essentially legalize mushrooms for medical purposes. So there's, there's ways to get involved in, in lots of different places. I think Brian is exactly right on the ground up uh, approach. I mean, you know, Joe Biden didn't wake up one morning and just decide, you know what, it feels like the day I should pardon a bunch of people for marijuana. It's because there's been so much public dialogue taking place around this and you know obviously in his circles that means you know senators and members of congress and very rich and powerful people but you know that dialogue really gets created by the activity that's occurring at the state and local level and and all the the progress that's being made so you know when i get asked this question i think the easiest way to answer it because obviously you know you could try to art articulate it based on the deals like brian did like well depending on which state you're in you can volunteer for the campaign or do this or that uh oh, overall i mean you know i've always been just amazed by how much people do dedicate to this on a volunteer basis and just you know passionate people I, I like i said from the beginning i'm incredibly fortunate that i was able to find a way to make a living doing this but a lot of people don't have that luxury and they they have jobs and they have responsibilities and so what i would generally tell people is like you know talking about this and you know if you're in a state where it's not legal yet it means talking to people who may not think it should be legal and, and explaining why you think it should be and I, you know talking to your friends and your family members you don't need to go in front of the grocery store and stop strangers i mean if you want to that's great but you know, talk to the people closest to you about it. Uh, if you're in a state where it's already legal, there's like Brian mentioned, there's certainly issues that still need to be addressed. But what I would like to see, you know, I think the next step is around promoting responsible use. And, uh, you know, particularly, you know, this is a, this is a, a substance that a lot of people aren't familiar with. I mean, even if they used it in college or they, you know, once ate brownies, it is just a new experience for a lot of people and we shouldn't assume that th that everyone knows what they're doing and it really does require you know non-judgmental discussion like not belittling someone because they don't know you know what a particular product is or how it works but but really making sure that you know your friends and the people around you understand this stuff uh so that we can see this this industry succeed i, I think that's an excellent point because those of us who've been in the space for a long time like i feel like i hold a lecture with my friends almost every time I'm hanging out with them to try to inform them about, you know, new product categories or what it's like to understand doses. It's, and I, I don't know. And so there's only so many of us who can kind of be the, the local informants on these things. But yeah, I think that's a great way to talk about it. And I think it would frankly help people to have a better relationship with the category instead of, you know, having an experience, being surprised by it and, and walking away saying it's not for me. But so I think that's a really great idea. And it's it's better for society, too. But uh, Brian, you know, you mentioned something that reminded me of, you know, reefer madness and all, all of the hysteria around cannabis to begin with, which is why you've especially carried this heavy lift of unwinding um, prohibition, essentially. And so 
one of the things Sai and I had been talking about earlier in the year is some of the media hysteria we were seeing again, especially from one part. I, I can't even remember her name because I think my brain refuses to hold on to it. But, you know, Mason, it reminded me again, as I'm going to bring up the Nancy Grace interview, would you mind sharing with us a little bit about how you view the way we can interact with the media that can help them or that can disempower them. And, and I thought you did it so masterfully. We're going to put the link in the show notes so that people can watch it. Because if people who haven't been around long enough to know, like SNL, didn't SNL do a, a yeah. skit on it? Yeah, that was amazing. I mean, talk about relevancy, right, in culture. But, so would you talk a little bit about that and also what we can take away from that going into the future, seeing as that sometimes it feels like we make these great steps forward and then you have a talking head that's totally trying to dismantle the progress we've made. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I will say that overall, the media is more informed about cannabis than ever before. Problem is, that's not saying much. You know, one of the issues, especially in today's media environment, is that, you know, such high turnover, you know, and I, I, I hate to talk as if I'm like this old man who's like, you're referencing, you know, years back, but there was a time uh, <laughs> when, you know, there was a, a single reporter that was following what was going on. You know, they were working the cannabis beats. They were following a campaign. They, you know, they didn't know much at the beginning, but they learned about it as they were going and you didn't have to explain everything to them. These days, like the current media situation, there's such high turnover. People are, you know, being let go and finding new positions, bouncing around, that every time you talk to a reporter, in a lot of cases, you got to start from the beginning and you got to explain everything. They just aren't familiar with things. And, and, and uh, you know, I don't mean to paint everyone the same brush. Obviously, there's a lot of great uh, cannabis specific outlets where people are very informed, of course. But I'm talking about the mainstream media, the local newspapers, TV stations and, and national uh, cable news. You know, we, we talked about the Biden thing and how surprising that was. Uh, you know, I've done media work for Brian and the Sensei Cedar for so long. And, you know, they always, always complain that I don't get them on the, you know, the cable news stations, which, you know, is true. But I've always said, like, guys, they're just not talking about cannabis. And that's been the case. I mean, honestly, since the day Donald Trump was elected, there were maybe four or five times the word marijuana was mentioned on CNN. And so I, I distinctly remember uh, that day this month, I keep CNN on the background while I'm working and they said marijuana and it got my attention. And, you know, it was the first time in a long time, but, you know, I started talking to reporters about it and they just really did not know much about uh, the background behind all this, the scheduling process, the fact that cannabis is schedule one and the difference between descheduling or rescheduling. I mean, they just don't know these things. And, you know, it's really imperative that there are professional people out there that can be patient with them and, and provide them with that information. So it's been 10 years since Colorado uh, legalized, and a lot has changed since then with you know, many, many more states following uh, Colorado's lead here. What do you guys uh, envision the next 10 years look like? You know, this November will be really interesting because I think my guess is we'll wake up November 9th and there'll be 24 states with legal marijuana instead of 2019. And then I think Oklahoma will legalize probably, I think it was March they put on the ballot. And I bring that up because I think there's like a psychological and policy milestone there. Like we're suddenly going to have 25 or 26 states, majority or close to majority, or half of all states with adult use cannabis. And I just think that at that point, it's ridiculous that, that it's illegal federally, right? And again, you'll have those members of Congress going to represent their states, but I think that'll be a bit of a tipping. And I think the, you know, we've talked about the you know, fairly incredible progress since Colorado and Washington have lost 17 new states in 10 years. I think we could see, you know, an additional 20 states in five years. I think it, I think it's just going to roll from there. And of course, that'll create pressure on the federal government to, to take action as well. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with Brian. We're going to see more and more jurisdictions, whether they are states or, or countries, moving towards uh, an end to cannabis prohibition and uh, you know we're going to see this you know the development of these laws in a similar way that we've seen with alcohol laws where you know there are constant issues that need to be addressed there's market developments there's you know developments in products uh, new things coming out you know just when it seems that you've seen everything powdered alcohol comes out how the hell do you deal with that you know and that had to be something that state legislatures around the country had to deal with you know 
with the level of, of research and development that's going to be taking place that already is taking place, uh, we're just going to continue to see uh, that that type of stuff, uh, you know, has to be dealt with. And of course, there's competing interests. You know, there are smaller businesses, larger businesses, just like in any other industry, and they're constantly jockeying for policies that best help them uh, run their businesses. So I think we'll just you know, it, the big difference will be, it's just not going to be exciting anymore. If it's, unless you're you know, <laughs> jaded like me and already don't find it all that exciting, but you know, it's, it's really like, does anyone really care that much about the bill that's in their state legislature around, you know, which businesses get to sell three, two beer versus full strength beer. I mean, some people do, but it's just not a sexy you know, crazy issue anymore. And, you know, I think that's what the future holds for marijuana. It's going to become duller and more boring. And quite frankly, that's a good thing. Yeah, well said. Uh, the, it, it's come a long way it, when it's uh, really boring and no one cares anymore. Uh, that Yeah, I'm with you. I think that means it's a good thing. Well, uh, Mason, Brian, thanks so much for joining us. And really, thanks so much uh, for everything you did uh, with Colorado in the beginning and everything you continue to do to kind of change policy around cannabis. It, it takes takes a lot of people, and I know you guys have had a huge impact. So really, thanks for everything you've done uh, so far and will continue to do in the future. And thanks for joining us on The High Rise. My pleasure. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The High Rise Podcast, presented by Headset. For more information on Headset, visit headset.io.